All right, so in this next video, we're just going to talk about functions of, of several variables generally and a little bit about notation that we might use to describe them. Uh, so a lot of times when you look through a calculus textbook, a textbook on calculus of several variables, um, and our textbook is no exception, you'll find that they kind of go through, okay, here's what we do for functions of two variables. And then they do, okay, and oh, by the way, now, now here's what it looks like for functions of three variables. Um, and of course, you've already seen what things look like if you're dealing with, say, a vector-valued function of one variable. Um, and, and these are all treated as different things, but really, they're, they're, all just, they're all just functions, right? We know what a function looks like, right? So remember, and this is kind of going back to Math 2000, um, What do you need to have a function? Well, you need two things. You need a domain. And in principle, this could be any set, right? Um, functions are defined from one set to another. So your domain could be any set, right? So let's call it uh, maybe D, right? And what else do you need? You need you need a you know this so-called rule. Um, to assign a unique value. To each element. Of your domain. Right. Um, and, and the, the defining property of function is this uniqueness here, right? And, of course, these values, they live in some other set, right? Um, in Calc 1, of course, the domain and the codomain, which is the set where your function takes values, um, these are both subsets of the real numbers. Um, in fact, the codomain is always R, right? Um, when you get to, say, Calculus 3, your domain is still a subset of the reals, but your codomain could now be r2 or r3, and you might think of that either as a set of points or as a vector space, depending on whether you want to think of, you know, curves in the plane or curves in space, or do you want to think about vector-valued functions, uh, right? But function means function regardless of the context. And because in Calc 4 we look at a lot of different scenarios, we'll look at functions of two variables, three variables. We'll look at vector-valued functions of one variable. We'll look at vector fields, which are vector-valued functions of several variables. Um, it ends up being useful to specify these things, right? Um, so if we want to specify the domain, and we might want to specify the codomain, Right, which is where the range lives. Uh, we're going to write something like this. We'll write something like f is a function, and we'll say it's a function that takes points in d. And we and we want to say where d lives because this is how we're going to specify how many variables our function uses. So we'll write something like this. We'll say d is a subset of some R n. Okay, and so it's going to take points in R n and it's going to assign them to points in some other space, which is going to be some Rm, right? Um, so M and N here, they could, either one of them, they, they don't have to have the same value, they can be different values, and they could be one, two, three, they could be larger values, although we generally are going to restrict to one, two, three in this course, there's no reason to other than those tend to be the dimensions, you know, that we can visualize because we live in three dimensions. Um, but you could go to four dimensions or higher. There's no real reason that you can't, right? And there are, of course, a lot of contexts where you want to consider more than three variables, right? More than three dimensions. Um, I mean, if you're doing physics, you might want to consider four dimensions if you're including time. Um, if you're doing, you know, economics or finance, you might want to work with hundreds or even thousands of variables, uh, depending on sort of the situation that you're modeling. Um, so there are lots of reasons why you might want to consider different values for n and for m, right? Um, and and we can we can look at some of these. So just as as an example, right? Just to give you one example of a, a function like this, uh, we could do something like this. We could say. 
Um, well, and, you know, we do the same kind of lazy thing that we do in Calc 1, which is we don't really specify the domain. We just give you the formula, we give you the rule, and leave the rest up to context. So we might say something like this. We might say, well, f of x, y is, what is it? Um, 1 over the square root of 1 minus x minus y, right? So if we wanted to be more specific, we would say in this case, we'd say, well, f then is a function from some domain d. Uh, where is this d? What is it a subset of? Well, I've got two input variables, x and y. So d is a subset of r2. What kind of output do I get? Uh, well, this is just a number, right? Once I choose values for x and y, so for example, if I did something like f of, uh, let's say, minus 2, and, uh, I don't know, minus 1. I'm going to get 1 over the square root of 1 minus minus 2, so plus 2 minus minus 1 plus 1. 1 over the square root of 4, so I get, I get a half, right? I get a number out. So the input is a point in R2. The output is a real number. Okay, that's, uh, that's simple enough. Uh, what if I actually wanted to know what that domain is? Well, what is D? What is D? Um, what do I need for this function to be defined? I need x plus y. Uh, it needs to be smaller than 1, right? Uh, I can't have a negative under the square root, and I can't divide by 0. So I get a domain that looks something like this. We'll We'll draw the line, x plus y equals 1, but we don't include it. Uh, if we want to leave a point out of a set, the convention is to just draw a dashed line. Okay, So we have that dashed line, x plus y equals 1. And then we want to indicate that we're keeping everything, well, everything below the line, because we want to be less than 1. And so you can just sort of you know, shade that region to indicate that, right? So if we wanted to write that as a set, you know, we could say that D is the set of all points x, y, um, such that x plus y is less than 1, right? If you wanted to, you could say points x, y in R2, but I think it's clear from the context that that should be a point in R2. Okay, all right. Um, let's do one more example. We've got a little bit of time. We could also do something like this. We could do, let's say, s of t is equal to, let's say, t squared for t. Maybe throw in a natural log, right? So this would be what? This would be a function s going from some domain d, which is a subset now of r, because we have only one input. And there are three coordinates in the output. So this is a function that goes from R to R3. Okay. And what is the domain? Well, in this case, we can actually just write it as an interval, right? These are defined for all values of t. The natural log is only defined if t is positive. So the domain is an interval, 0 to infinity. All right. <coughs> So you'll see this sort of notation specifying functions throughout the course. Uh, the other bit of notation that you'll probably see from time to time is you're going to see vector notation. And the vector notation can be convenient uh, because well, one thing that's nice about vectors as compared to points is you can add vectors, right? Um, so there will be a number of times where, you know, we're talking about limits, we're talking about derivatives, things like that. We might want to talk about, you know, combining two points, adding two points. Um, vector notation might come up. Um, but the main, the main feature here is that we, um, we won't necessarily... Uh, we're not always going to distinguish... between a point, say, um, you know, x1, x2, up to x, let's say, n, if it's in Rn, and, you know, a vector. 
And depending on the context, you might see this sort of calculus or physics style notation for vectors. You might see this sort of standard linear algebra style notation for a vector as a column vector, <coughs> depending on the context. Uh, really the only place that we're going to need column vectors is if we're going to be talking about you know, defining linear functions in terms of matrix multiplication. We might want to write column vectors there. Otherwise, we'll probably use the angle bracket notation for our vectors. Um, and this means that you can write things like, you know, you could write things like f of x equals y, you know, um, where, you know, x is, is really standing in for something like x1 through to xn, and y is really standing in for, you know, f1 of, of x down to f, let's say, k of x, right? Um, if you're dealing with functions of several variables that have several components, I at some point it gets really cumbersome to specify all the variables and all the components. You're going to write things out, these expressions that are huge. Um, so sometimes it's, it's nice to just write something like this as shorthand for some really big long expression that shows all the variables and components. Um, this will be especially convenient when we talk about things like limits and we get the added bonus that when you put limits into this notation, you realize that there's, you know, the, the basic idea of a limit is exactly the same as it was in one variable. Uh, we'll look at that next.